All right, good evening. It's good to see everybody again, and welcome to you watching uh, live online. Um, you're at Olivet Baptist Church this evening, and we're again going through systematic theology, looking at different categories uh, that are in the Bible theologically, doctrinally, and now we're trying to connect dots. We have a new outline that we started, which was the uh, church dynamic, and I made a comment, I think last week, that why aren't churches today the way the first century church was? We have the same Holy Spirit, same God, same Christ. And yet when you look at them, uh, had nothing to do with size, nothing. Um, and they were a really powerful church. Today, you don't see that. And, and I don't care if you got the smiling preacher with 30,000 people, they don't match up with this small group of believers. I'm really interested as to why. And so we're, I'm, hopefully we can try to answer that when we work through this. Um, but as always, before we do, I want to make a couple of quick announcements that if you're watching online, um, uh, Sister Sharon was kind enough to type up the categories of the prayer uh, subjects and the major benchmarks, two or three in each section. And they are online there's a, you link on to principles for prayer, and, and then you'll see a link on video description, and you'll be able to pull them down if you're looking at them online. But they are done. It'll be an easy way to apply what we learned without going through these massive pages of notes, you know. So that's one thing. Uh, the other is we want to take unspoken requests. So if you have any, okay, see it in the back. Yep. Okay, that's pretty much everybody, including me. All right, uh, for those of you that are watching, you can lift up your re request also. We'll be praying for that. And then we'll ask the Holy Spirit to teach us about that New Testament first century church. So let's pray. Father, again, we come before you and we thank you that, well, that you're a type of God that wants to know us intimately wants to address the concerns that we have. It's a parent-child relationship. And so we're coming before you now with some unspoken requests. And again, I'm always reminded that the Holy Spirit that indwells each person knows our emotions and our thoughts and our worries, um, that we don't even have to share them with you verbally and he transposes our feelings before you. In fact, if the only word we could ever say is, oh God, he would be able to take that statement and include the emotions and the feelings and the concerns of whatever unspoken request we have. That's reassuring. There is no human therapist, psychiatrist, or counselor that can come close to that. So now we are taking, each of us, both those watching online and those present here, we are going to ask the Holy Spirit to do that. To take the feelings and concerns we have for the very prayer request we're asking help for and to transfer them up to you. So that for each one of us, you know exactly what we're battling, what our desires are, the struggles possibly that may be included. And Father, would you just again reassure us through your word, through the very work of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, and through the circumstances of life as we navigate through them that you would use any and all of those three elements and minister to our particular prayer requests. We thank you that you're a God that is concerned even about the smallest detail. Help us to trust you now. Help us to thank you that you've heard it and you'll address it. And again, give us the patience to wait on you. Even if we're coming back here next Wednesday, and it's the same request. Remind us that 
a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. In other words, it's not the time frame that we have down here. We count the days and the weeks and the months. Where you are, it's timelessness. No clock. So whenever we get done going through what we need to go through, and you are observing it and guiding those situations, then would you answer, please? And we want to glorify you in it. So make sure that we know it's not a coincidental answer, but it's specific. May you get the glory for it. Holy Spirit, again, help us again tonight. Want to get an insight view of this new first century church and what makes it so different. How are they able to do what they do and they're not big in numbers and they don't have wealth and they're getting a lot of persecution and yet they're producing. They're bringing glory to you. How do they do it? So Holy Spirit, as we work through this outline and the next one on part two, would you give us a glimpse of how they're doing it so we can copy it as believers? We ask this in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, uh, quick review. You have the outline. Remember, we said there are three types of church, three conditions every church uh, has uh, stagnant, neither hot or cold. That's in the intro here. Um, cold in theology and lifestyle, and in the dynamic church. It's not necessarily numbers, numbers are a false measuring stick for churches. Um, it's the people inside and the growth and their walk with the Lord that is the critical thing. Um, so as we work through this, we want to take a look at some factors that uh, we can look in ourselves and the church in general and, and see how we measure up. So with that being said, um, I'm going to, oh boy, I got this in the mail. So. If I show it to you, you're going to know the church. It's a church here in, in the community. But they did a flyer, and I get it. It's the typical seminary approach to try to bring in people. But it was a flyer, and it starts out by saying, does a good relationship, relationship seem like a fantasy? Have you ever caught yourself looking at someone else and thinking, I wished I had her marriage? Or are you ever tempted to think, I wish we didn't fight, or I wish we had more sex, or I wish I had married another person. A better relationship doesn't need to come from a genie and a lamp. It's possible. And then he says, we're doing a five-part series on real issues that you're facing in relationships. Now. Is that why we go to church? <laughs> you, you know, this, and no offense, I'm sure this guy's committed, loves the Lord, I'm sure they do. But do you see what the church has bought into today? That's what the world wants to talk about. Now, are all these things uh, doable as a Christian? Yeah, but they're secondary benefits. That's not the primary reason. The primary reason is learning about sin, learning about our heart, learning what we're doing on Sunday in terms of sanctification, how that works in our lifestyle, living in the world, but not of it. And in fact, Sunday morning, I'm really excited because we're going to look at application of sanctification. We're going to look at what is expected of believers and can they do it based on them being set apart, made holy, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So all I want you to see is, oh, and by the way, they had a special guest, a football player that was going to talk about his experience in the NFL. Now, all I'm saying is that's not the hook. This first century church never talked about that. They had one message. We're going to hear it Sunday for the world. They had one message and they pounded it. And eventually, we're still talking about that movement. We're part of it. So 
Um, heads up on that. Let's look at Roman numeral number one. Factors involved in the birth of the church. Remember, in the Old Testament, they had the synagogue. They didn't have a church. And it was definitely not the way um, Christ uh, uh, envisioned it and, and developed it. This is a whole different ball game now. So we want to look at the birth. We want to look at their char characteristics and then the dynamics. Okay. So, and we have a, we do have another outline whenever we finish this. So Roman number one, the fulfillment of the promises of Christ. Um, we have John 14 in chapters 14, 15, and 16. So let's take a look at, at that. And again, I'll be reading from the, um, NIV version. First is John, uh, chapter 14, verse one will be our first one. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Now, this is a comfort issue. We already talked about it. Remember, we said that they were troubled. Christ was leaving. That sort of really shook them up because they won't see him again. So now he's telling them twice, don't worry. I got to do if I do this, then I'll never leave you. That was the big thing. See, right now I have to leave. But when I send the Holy Spirit, I'll never leave you now because he's going to live inside of you. So you're going to have even a closer walk with me as a result. Um, 1426, same chapter, verse uh, 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And then um, we have chapter 15, 26 and 27. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All right, that's the second encouragement and a little challenge. And then we have John 16, chapter 16, verse 7, and then verse 13. So verse 7. Um, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. Drop down to verse uh, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Okay, so um, these, these promises were fulfilled in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came. You remember that? Acts chapter 2, and, and I think we talked about that, the different ethnic groups that were present. Um, there was a speaking in tongues, which is a known spoken language, to people that never knew the language, sharing the gospel to that person. Uh, that's when the Holy Spirit came, and that's when you had the birth of, of the New Testament church. So the difference between the New Testament and the Old, the Holy Spirit came upon people for work and then never indwelled them. So when David had a work to do, the Holy Spirit would come upon him. He would do the work or the prophet, and then the Holy Spirit would be gone. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon us, but indwells in us and never leaves us. In fact, it's a, they don't do it much anymore, but it's like, you know, remember the layaway, put it on layaway? Well, that's what it is. God has put you on layaway by sealing you, giving a deposit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit that says, this is my kid. And the Holy Spirit seals you as a down payment for when he comes back or if we pass first then we are with him. And that puts us in the true church. So look what you have today. You got churches. Then you have the church universal, which is spiritual, the true church, the ones that, because as we all know, everybody in church and some churches are a little crazy, but they're not saved, you know? So 
the true church is that person that has accepted Christ. It's real in his or her life. And the Holy Spirit now puts them in the church universal spiritually. And that Holy Spirit lives inside of that person or anyone else that accepts Christ. Um, letter B, the arrival of the Holy Spirit. John 20, um, verse 22. And then I do have a little sidebar that we'll get to um, and, and ask some questions. Um, it's coming up. John 20, uh, verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is to the disciples prior to the church, okay, to the Acts 2. Um, but these guys got that relationship first. They were the ones that walked with him. Uh, they were the ones now that he gave the Holy Spirit to. And the interesting thing about it is after that, did you notice that Jesus would come in amidst, doors would be locked, and then boom. Then he'd be gone, in and out, in and out. And that was actually setting up the situation that says, look, when this guy comes, you don't have to worry about any more of this. I'm always with you now. Now the game plan is, how well can you get to know me in this setting? That's a challenge for us. How well can we get to know Christ in an intimate, personal walk? Because their walk was way different than what we see today. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to throw out some questions, but there's something drastically different. And I, I would say this, and some people may get upset with me. If you pull the Holy Spirit out of all the evangelical churches today, okay, the good churches, not the ones that are, you know, if you pull them out, I venture to say that people wouldn't even recognize it and it would be church as usual. That's my opinion. And that, that's not good, but it's more in the effort of the person instead of the Holy Spirit leading them. I don't think they would recognize it. I really don't. And so we want to though, we want to get to the point where we see that dynamic. Um, in our personal life and actually in the church, you know. Um, so keep that in mind. Arrival of the Holy Spirit, 12 got it first, and then uh, Acts 2. And then um, the organism for fulfilling the Great Commission was needed. Okay, so look what happened. God in the Old Testament picked Israel to be the church, if you will. Just picture that. Um, their job, since they had a relationship with the only true and living God, was to go out and evangelize other nations and say, look, our God is the real God, and, and win them to Jehovah. They failed. They had numerous chances, and they didn't even know how to read the darn book. I mean, their preachers were out to lunch. They couldn't even interpret it. The interpretation went skewed, so they're trying to live it in the flesh. So finally, what ends up happening is the church today, as we know it, becomes the true Israel, if you will. Now Israel, they're not the conduit now to share the gospel and win people to Christ. His church is. We've taken that spot. Okay? And it doesn't mean that Jews aren't saved. Some are. Majority are not. After, If you go to Israel, most of them are Zionists. They're atheists. I had the opportunity to talk to a couple of guides. And I was asking them, so how do you guys feel? About yeah, most of us are just atheists. But we're all for Israel. The country, the nation. Okay? And you could see that. Uh, and that was a long time ago. Uh, I'm assuming it's much worse now uh, in terms of that. So, so God took a different approach. His church worldwide is the venue from which the gospel is to be shared and to fulfill the Great Commission. So now I'm wondering if the church is doing that 
you know uh, on a consistent basis. Not sure. Um, I think we get so self-centered, we want good relationships. So we go to a series where they're, they're talking about relationships, you know, and I, I don't know. It, we're, I'm going to push an angle here in a, in a minute, and then you can you can see where I'm going. Go ahead, Linda. Is that going to change for Israel? It is um, when it says that the nation will be born again in one day, um, but I think it's going to we may we won't be here when that happens. I mean that whole um, revelation and the and and the seven year. Um, you know, situation is going to come come about because it says that they're going to see his handprints and and they're going to notice that, oh, my gosh, we crucified the Messiah. You know, and um, in fact, even Egypt is going to be converted as a nation um, that that's also true. But they will. And keep in mind, if you read Romans, uh, I think it's nine, ten and eleven or 70, I'm not sure. There's three chapters on Israel and the Jews. And, and you know, Paul says, salvation is from the Jews. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile, you know. Um, so obviously, um, they will, uh, uh, you know, be saved. But look at all the ones between now and that happens, how they've they failed to um, understand the scriptures, you know. And I remember I was invited to, uh, oh boy, I'll probably get in trouble. I invited to a bat mitzvah. It was a, uh, not a bar mitzvah. It was for a girl. My, my daughters were close friends. And, and I remember the, the dad was so excited just to introduce me to the female rabbi. And so that tipped me in terms of liberal theology, uh, you know, versus conservative theology. And so he introduced me and he goes, hey, this, this guy's a minister. So she goes, God is one. So I already, OK, we're going to do this really. OK, so I said, yeah, you're right. And I knew what she was saying. Because they don't buy the fact that, you know, Jesus is the Messiah and, and the Trinity. So I, I said, well, you got, you're right. God is one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And she looked at me and we never said anything else the rest of the time, you know. But, um, but anyway, it, it, I thought, gosh, you know. Um, and again, it, it hurts me when the teaching is bad then people don't know. And that's really, you know, an issue in a, in a church today. If, it, if it's bad, then you can't expect the pew to get it. You, you know, you're the guy that's supposed to deliver it. And um, so now I think it's changed. The bigger, the better, the bigger the show. Um, it's become more entertainment oriented. You know, I saw a church here the other day, I was driving by and it was packed, but, you know, you had a circus and you had stuff out. And I'm going, really, would, would Jesus do that to draw him? I mean, because they said, man, when this guy opened up the scriptures, it came to life. You know, I mean, it was like, whoa, the real issues. So uh, let's. But anyway, birth of the church, Holy Spirit starts it. This is the venue that God is going to use from now on. It's not going to be the, the synagogue. It won't be Israel. It's going to be his church, whom he bought and paid for uh, with his life. Okay, Roman numeral two. The characteristics of the infant church. It was tiny. Only about 120 people. That's not big, uh, you know. I think the average church in America today is 60 people across the board. Now we have all the mega churches here, so we think, whoa, we, that, we see bigger church. That's true. But nationwide, they put the average, it's about 60 people. So this was double, is double that, but it's not big. Nobody would consider it 120. We, we had more at, in Compton. We doubled that. So, but were we like them? 
the, no. Uh, I mean, we, it was some interesting things happening, but I want to see how do we get here? You know, everything is the same. Holy Spirit, God, Christ, even the fallen nature, there's no difference. So, you know, we can discover it, number two, or B rather. And this is where I think, this is one thing I think is, is a turning point. It was yielded to the will of Christ as he has been yielded to the will of the Father. So let me do a little sidebar here and take a look at, ask a couple of questions, a couple of, of thoughts, I, I think. Um, I want to read to you John chapter 2, verse 5. So this is not in the notes. It's more of a sidebar of what made this church so unique. Um, okay, here's what it says. This is where Jesus changes. He did about eight miracles in the Gospel of John. Real miracles, okay? And this is one of them. But here's what I want you to focus on. His mother, Jesus' mother, said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Okay? Now, that is... I think one of the differences between the first century church and us today, um, they lived in obedience to God's will. Now, what does that require? Total. So let's, let's throw it out and, you know, just dialogue. I mean, there's, I'm not looking for a right answer. I'm just looking for ideas. If you live if, to, in obedience to God's will and you do whatever he asks, what does that take from you and I? What would that take for a person to, to be in that condition and be able to do that? Okay. Okay. That, that true. Knowing his word would be a uh, would would be a big part of it. Um, not just head knowledge, but. Knowing how it works, I'm assuming that's, you, you know, the relationship. What about, and so I can maybe piggyback on that. That requires constant communion with Christ. Yep. You got to be committed to it. You got to be talking to him all the time. You, you, you know, it's a, it's a, we talked about it uh, last week. It's a communion uh, where you and I are constantly you know, interacting with him, not just on Sunday, um, you know, but every day, you, you know, it requires, I think that's the first thing. Um, now, if you have to do that as a requirement, think about this now, what does that require from you and I? If we're going to be in communion with Christ on a daily basis and, and it's real communion, you, you know, really like, like, hey, Jesus, good morning. I got these issues. And then you're, you're telling him, and then you're not asking, you're just saying, I got these issues. What can you give me? And, and then he, you, you sit quietly. And then you're waiting for him to flood your mind. Or nothing maybe happens there. And then you open up the scriptures and you're reading. And then a verse pops out that ministers to that issue. What does that whole thing take? Yeah, uh, submissiveness, it, it, it's, there is a yield that is there. I'm, I'm thinking more of, on the time factor. Faith and trust. Faith and trust. Okay, so, so you, you need to believe him. It takes faith and trust. Those are all true. But what does it take to get there, to have this communion and this time with him? It does take discipline. These are all good. You guys are loading up the back end. I need that first end right now. If, if you and I are going to say, hey, I'm going to spend time with Christ. I'm going to read his word. I'm going to talk to him. It does take all of those. But, but um, how much, how much, yeah. See, everything you said is right there, but this takes time. 
right? I mean, uh, this past week, um, I was upset with myself because, you know, my phone started ringing uh, and, and I'm, I'm trying to have the quiet time. I got up late. The alarm went off. I overslept. So now, guess what? I'm, I'm in, you know, so I grabbed, I thought, well, I got to have a quiet time. But you know what? It was horrible because I, I didn't have the time. So I, ran, I had a little devotional. I read it. Okay. Yeah, you, you know, and then I went out the door and I was upset with myself. And I thought, this is, this is not good. What is this? Now I'm doing a mechanical thing, you know. Um, that would almost be like me, let's just say, calling Crystal. And I got three minutes. Hey, Crystal, good to see you. Good morning. How's it going? Bye. What? Are you kidding? You, you, you know, what is that? But I checked it off. I called my friend, you, you know, let's say. Um, no, this is where we have to back. A lot of things are pulling for our time in the world. A lot of things. And I find that's my biggest battle. That is my hardest battle. So I have to figure out, again, uh, maybe I got to get up a little bit earlier. I don't know. You know, but I didn't like it. This happened three days and I could tell the difference, you, you, you know, in a number of things with my personality. So it does take time. So look what you're telling me now. Living in obedience to God's will requires constant communication, some sort of, and that takes time. It requires time to spend with him, right? Okay. That time spent with him results in you being more attuned to the Holy Spirit. Because now, you know, you can hear that inner voice. You can, I'll give you a good example. We were talking about the four laws here um, a couple weeks ago. So in my quiet time, two weeks ago, the Holy Spirit brings up a 93-year-old woman who lives in an apartment building that I don't even know her, but I see her walking. I mean, she's a walkaholic, okay, all day. And so the Holy Spirit puts on my heart, you need to give her four laws. What? I don't even know her. You need to do it. If you, have you looked at her lately? And I was like, yeah. What do you see? Well... Uh, She's not going to be around long. That's right. That's right. So I didn't do it initially. I didn't. I'm going to go up to her and, you know, she didn't know me from Adam, you know. So yesterday I go for a walk because I was a little upset with myself. And I said, you know what, Lord, let me, let's just talk. Let me go for a walk, man. So I'm going for a walk. Who do you think I see? Her. Right. And she has her walker and she's sitting. Now, she had done her walk. I'm just starting. And I look at her and I wave. Don't think anything of it. Go through my routine. Come back. She looks at me again, smiles, waves. And the Holy Spirit says, here's your chance. Go get the four laws. So I thought, all right, so get home, get the four laws. She's sitting there, right, still in, on the walker thing with a little seat there. And I said, beautiful day, isn't it? She goes, oh, yeah, I've been walking all day, been out in the sun all day long. And I went, have you ever heard of the four laws? She said, no. Then I said, wow, God, look at this. I said, you know what? Let me give this to you. She goes, do you know somebody in the building? And I said, yeah, I know the, the big tall guy. And, and I said, You've never seen this. She goes, no. Take it and read it when you, when you get in your apartment. She said, okay, thank you very much. And that was it. And then I walked back home and I felt so good. But it was only because I was obedient to his will, I, it, you, you know. And because he was showing me, look, you should have done it earlier. If this lady dies, I've already asked you to do it. And you neglected it. If she dies and doesn't know me, you had a chance. 
That's what, you, you know, and I said, I, I, I'm going back. Give me the four laws and we'll do it. So it's that, that takes time to have that sensitivity, okay? So the first major thing is you spend the time. It takes time and you have this communion, obedience to God's will. The second thing, I think, and again, it's not in your outline, um, and you guys brought it up, the full obedience presupposes a yieldness to Christ. If you're going to have total obedience to Christ, that means you're willing to yield to him. You're willing to give his will first, not yours or, or, or mine. Okay, And so that's a hard one, too. Time is hard because we got to block it out. Be disciplined. We got to do it. Uh, yieldness is hard because you're saying no to the flesh, our desires. Um, and and, and it, so it means that you're constantly before Christ asking him, what do you want me to do? You know, and, and so that's not easy because I don't know about you, but. Our fallen nature, that remnant that we have in us, is self-centered. I mean, we do it when we want to do it, you know. And so that's difficult. And I think the third thing that a lot of people, a lot of Christians are unwilling to do is accept the responsibility of obedience. And let me share with you what that means. That means if you're going to be totally committed to his will, and be in communion with him where he tells you to do something like his mom. Whatever he asks, do it. Okay. You're going to have a clash with people. Uh, some of your family members, they're not going to like what you have to say. And, they, and it may be your, uh, it'll be your desires will be contrary to your family or friends. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, when I... <laughs> I uh, think of it when I was I wanted to be a lawyer, so wanted to go to law school and I was actually the first um, person in my family to go to college. My grandparents immigrated here in the early 1900s and so nobody went to college. So I was the first. Then when I said I'm going to be a lawyer, my grandfather thought, wow, that's you're going to be somebody. Now watch what happens. So now I'm doing all of this. I'm preparing for that, you know, get major in political science, graduate, go to law school, decide ah, something's wrong. Became a Christian my last semester in, in college. And long story short, I quit and I go to Campus Crusade for Christ to work with convicts and then ultimately seminary. My grandfather says... Now, nobody liked this decision. Even my parents were a little skeptical, you know. Um, my grandfather said, and I started laughing because he had this real heavy Greek accent, and he went, I thought you were going to be somebody. <laughs> and I started, I couldn't help but laugh, you know, because he didn't know he was not saved at that particular time. And, you know, and so... When you're doing God's will, sometimes even family, you know, it doesn't fit, you, you know, and you have to be willing to accept that. Um, also, there's a lot of tears that go with doing God's will that and, and thorns. It's not always, you know, ice cream and cookies. It's hard, you know. Um, I just went through it. What did I share with my daughters, you know, that that, you know, I'm sharing my heart with them, but. But it's good, but it's not always, you know, the, hard, the easiest thing. Um, I know for a preacher, I can say this much. If you want to be a, if your style is like a prophet, in other words, you're going to let it fly. And if you upset people, oh, well, it's a lonely walk because you don't get invited to the, to the, normal stuff you know they don't want you around and and so and that's fine too if you're willing to accept it um you know that that's good too but i just think accepting the responsibility um you're going to look you're going to be misunderstood you're going to look be looked at as odd these are some of the things 
if you want to get this close to Christ. I don't think most Christians want that. So they don't do it. Doesn't mean they're not saved. You know, it's just that they don't take it to that sold out level, if you will. Doesn't mean they're perfect. But, um, you know, it just means that, yeah, that's that extra thing. This little church, they were doing some amazing things. And we'll see more about it as we work through. Uh, here's another one. Um, it was united. Um, Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 1. A united church. They had the same goal. It wasn't a bunch of, uh, um, you know, bickering. And, and although that did come up, and they handled it and at one point. Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and 2. Verse 1. 1.14. So here's what it says. Um, 14. Here we go. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So praying, and let me throw this out. They were constantly doing that. They were all one in spirit. Now, here's what happens on a Sunday. Let's take a big church. Let's go with the smiling preacher, okay? Um, 30,000 show up on Sunday. How many of you think would show up on a... You, let me ask you this. Do 30,000 show up at prayer midweek? No. No, they don't. And if you take it any church... I don't just want to pick on him. You know, the numbers start to drop. And, and, and so that's an issue. This New Testament church, they were always praying, you know. And it wasn't just, and again, the, it's not the praying that's the secret. That's the conduit. It's who you're praying to, who your trust is in. And so um, obviously, Look at the miracles that they saw, you know, um, in their midst. And there's a reason for that. And if you look at Christ, watch this when you read the Gospels. He does ministry, backs off, he gets by himself to pray. Always getting away to pray. Always getting away to pray. Talking to his Father. And that's something we can emulate. We can do that. You know, we got an inside look at the categories that can help us. Now the challenge is to be able to do it and, and make, it, make it real. Not like you're going through a book, but talking. You're talking to your father. And, and so they had a way of doing it, and they were united uh, in it. 2-1, um, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. Here we go, in one place. So again, you see that same cohesiveness being united uh, same page, letter D, it was a happy church, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, 52 and 53. Okay. Luke 24, 52 and 53. And here's what it says. Then they worshiped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Now, it doesn't mean that they didn't eat, didn't go places. It means that this was their routine. This is what they did. Now, everybody did think they were odd, but they shook the place up. That's what's interesting. They were, they went against the culture. I want you to notice the part women played. If you look at the culture during that time, women were not, did not have a lot of, of, of uh, wherewithal opportunities, if you will. That wasn't the case in Christianity. You saw what I read on the Koran, okay? You don't find that in the Bible. And women had a key role uh, in that, and even their faith. Uh, actually was greater, I believe, at the, at the cross when they crucified him than, than the men. 
Um, you know, why I don't know, but they were, they were there first. They were looking for him first. And so, um, again, it was a happy church story. It was joy in the sense that their joy was from their worshiping their Savior. It was real to them. Um, and it made an impact on everybody else around them. These are some of the character traits of them. Um, then I have a question to ask you about today. Uh, what do you think? Think about this one, one, and I'll do these other two. What do you think the characteristics of the church today are that you observe? I'm not saying all of that. I'm saying just church in general. What's common? What do you see um, when you look at them? Uh, let me do E and F. Oh, and then I'll wrap it up. Okay. Uh, it develops separation and fellowship. We're going to talk about that tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, Sunday. There's a separation. We've been talking about, about that with um, sanctification. So let's see what we got here. Two scriptures and then we're out. Yeah, Acts 5, right? Is that it? Acts, Acts 5, 12, and 13. Okay. So let's see what they say here. Acts chapter 5. Verses 12 and 13. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Okay, uh, this was something. There was a little bit of reverence and, and fear of what they saw. Do we have that today in church? Nah, oh, no, we don't. No, we, I, I don't see it anywhere, uh, even by the believers. But, you know, there's, it's just not there. You see the difference? There was a, there's a difference here. Uh, it developed evangelism in missions, Acts 8.4. 8, 4. 8 4. And then we'll wrap it up. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So here we go again. They just took it with them. And look at God's move. You know what we tend to do? When we get in a position, the church at Acts got up to 2,000. So it was small when it started. Then everything explodes. Now guess what nobody wanted to do? Go anywhere. I'm sure they had the best choir. I'm sure everything was hunky-dory for them. They didn't want to go. So they want to stay there and do their thing. And then what do you think God does? Because remember, the goal is the Great Commission. So he gives him persecution. And guess who starts to run them down? Paul, the Romans. They got a little concerned because they didn't understand his thing. Jesus is a king. Caesar's king. What king are you worshiping? And so before you know it now... They're getting some heat, and they scatter. While they're scattering, they're talking to anybody, telling them about this experience that they've had. And I'll close with this. So for you and I, there's one thing we can do right now. Any Christian listening online, too. We don't have to set up a building and have a sermon. All we have to do is wherever we're going, Look for an opportunity to tell people about our personal experience with Christ. That's it. Tell them what Jesus is doing. There's no set plan how to do it. You don't have to preach. You don't even have to know the Bible. All you got to do is tell them what Christ is doing in your life even now. Not that you got saved 20 years ago. Let them know what he's doing now. How is he? Help? Let me share with you what Christ is doing. In my life right now, that's all you got to do. Just be a witness. Now, the Holy Spirit came to indwell us. And he is a witness to Christ, right? We, we learned it. He doesn't, do, he doesn't talk about himself. Now he's living in you and me. So who's he want to talk about? Christ. You and I are the ones that got to allow them to do it. Mm -hmm. And the, the test is, are we? Let's pray. 
Father, thank you again for us to look at a dynamic church. Boy, we always think in terms of the secular, bigger the better. We got to have 30,000 or it's not good. This little church started out really tiny. In fact, they had no celebrities. They had no name people. And yet, they had such a walk with you that you did amazing things through them. One of the first things that we notice is they talked about you. And even though there was persecution, they didn't sweat that. They still talked about you wherever they went. I pray for those watching online, and I pray for those that are here at Olivet and Benaya that we have that fire to just talk about you. That's why you, Holy Spirit, were given to glorify Christ and point people to Christ. Now you live in my body. I got to allow you to do it. So I pray for all of us that the challenge between now and the weeks to come is for you, Holy Spirit, to bring back to our minds that these people, a bunch of no names, talked about you, talked about Christ. May we copy them. And may you do mighty things in our midst that we too can see this display of power from you that is still evident today. Give us Travel and Mercy's home. Thank you for this group that took the time to get here, took the time to set aside to learn about you and to fellowship with you. The same for those online. Bless them abundantly for that. And thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Sunday, part two.